For me, leadership begins long before others recognize you as a leader. Ben Gurion was only 19. 19 when he stood up to the Bund for the first time. Do you know what the Bund was? The Bund was the biggest and most powerful Jewish movement in Europe. They're anti-Zionist, against the land of Israel. But Ben Gurion believes in his own truth, sees it through to the end. And he's only 19. David, what happened? You can't just walk out in the middle of the lecture. The whole town is in there. How can I sit there? Did you hear what that miserable man said about Herzl? That he's a fantasizer? A dangerous man? Please get me some paper. Why do you need paper? David, what are you doing? I'm writing keynotes. I'm going to challenge him. What do you mean you'll challenge him? He is the prominent agitator of the Bund. You're just an overenthusiastic 19-year-old. So what? So people don't do things like that. It's not, it's not proper. And speaking against the land of Israel, would that be proper? I'll tell you what's proper. Telling the truth, that is proper. And fighting for the truth, that is proper. But David, nobody thinks like we do. Not yet. So are you with me? <coughs> Gentlemen of the Bund, in the name of the Zionist movement, I have a few things to say to you. He knew how to dream. He knew how to look at the future and see it clearly in great detail. Even when a situation looked completely impossible. Just look at what he wrote about the workers. At the time of the second Aliyah, right? The workers in the land of Israel were barely surviving. They couldn't make a living. Most of them just gave up and left. But it's Ben Gurion who writes for the Poaletzion newspaper about the great workers movement that will lead Zionism. And look, he did it. I brought olives, too. <laughs> when was the last time you ate, Green? Ben Gurion. What? Not Green. Ben Gurion. What's that? Something new? I can no longer write about Zionism under a non-Hebrew name. Good for you. It should be good for you, too. What kind of name is Grossman? Hm. <laughs> I still don't understand. Why are people so angry about my article? You published an article openly contradicting the Zionist Congress. What were you thinking? It does not contradict the Zionist Congress. It's in support of the Hebrew worker. The Hebrew Yeshuv will be built by the Hebrew worker or will not be built at all? That's a bit pretentious. But that is the truth. Who, us? We'll build the Jewish state all by ourselves? When there are barely a few hundred workers in the entire land of Israel? A few hundred with whom we'll build a state and lead its government. David, what are you talking about? Just look at us. We're living from hand to mouth, struggling week after week to publish a measly little newspaper. You see us leading the Zionist movement? Take a look at reality, David. I did not come to the land of Israel just to look at reality. I came here to change we're it. We're all on the same side, enough. Yes, we're on the same side, but what about everyone else? What will they say? The farmers in the colonies who came here long before us, won't they have a different point of view? And the old Yishuv who've been living in Jerusalem and Hebron for over a hundred years with their own ideology? And we, the workers, will show them the light? And in our situation? What difference does our current situation make? What's important is what our situation will be tomorrow. And what needs to be done in order to get there? How do we establish a workers' union? A health fund for workers? A library for workers? A bank for the workers? And when all of this happens, everyone will follow us, because we were right. Shlomo, we won't become great if we don't dream big dreams. Now, my friend, look me in the eye and tell me the truth. What? Don't you have any more bread left? <laughs> <laughs> he had never commanded soldiers in battle. But if the most important issue in establishing the state was its security, then as a leader he must lead that too. He arranges a seminar for himself. He stops everything. 
He does nothing at all but sits and reads and studies and interviews anybody who has something to say on the matter. And he walks out Mr. Security. He decides that he now knows how to lead the war. And he's even ready to challenge his most experienced officers. The situation is not good. We still can't get to the convoy at Gush Etzion, who are fighting at Nebi Daniel. And Zerubbabel Horovitz blew up his armored vehicle rather than let himself and the wounded be captured by the Arabs. There are heavy casualties there. At Gichium, we've lost 46 fighters. In the Negev and Galilee, there's a dangerous shortage of what ammunition. What about the weapons from Czechoslovakia? They still haven't arrived. They're trying to avoid the British. And what about Jerusalem? Still besieged, still hungry, nothing new. We already have 500 fighters concentrated there. It's the biggest force the Haganah has That's in the country. That's not enough. This is a decisive war we're fighting. The fall of the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem could be a death blow to the entire Yishuv. Said 2,000 armed fighters with 2,000 rifles. That would mean pulling fighters out of crucial positions. So do it. We must breach the siege of Jerusalem. What do you mean, so do it? Is Degania less important than Jerusalem? Is Petak Tikva less important than Jerusalem? Jerusalem is of the utmost strategic importance. Please, leave strategic matters to us. If you don't understand the importance of Jerusalem, then you don't understand strategy. With all due respect, sir, the fact that you've read a How few books about How many mortars do we have? What? 700 two-inch mortars and less than 100 three-inch mortars. How many light machine guns? I'm sorry, sir, but what difference does that make? 800 and only 150 medium guns. I am perfectly aware and up to date with every aspect of our forces. And I also understand that we still fall short. But in order to fight and to win that fight, we need to know what we're fighting for. What should I tell them, the Jewish people? What should I say to the world? That there weren't enough weapons at Deganya? Without Jerusalem, there will be no state of Israel. Ben-Gurion, to do what you're asking will jeopardize everything on all our other fronts. And I shall bear full responsibility for this. Will you? Will you also be the one to face the families of the fallen? I stand and face the families of the fallen every day. This is the first time that I've ever done this, but I'm ordering you, by the authority vested in me, to breach the siege. You're responsible for security. It falls upon you. All the glory if we succeed, and all the blame if we fail. Yes, I know. Even if I don't always agree with him, you can still appreciate Ben-Gurion for not giving up on what he believed was right, even when everyone was afraid to do so. Take the reparations issue with Germany. Israel was boycotting Germany because of the Holocaust. But then Germany reached out and offered monetary reparations to be paid directly into the empty treasury of the state of Israel. What would you have done in his shoes? What is this about? We need to talk. The vote on the reparations agreement is in five minutes. What is so important that we need to talk the about agreement. it right now? We've spent the past year discussing the reparations agreement with Germany. The Central Committee has approved it. The Cabinet has approved it. What has changed? The people have changed. The people are against it. The people. <laughs> the people are against it? Who are the people? Has anybody asked them? One by one? The people are the tens of thousands protesting outside right now. Did anyone ask the Holocaust victims? All this money, with which we shall build our country, is their legacy. They don't want these monetary reparations. I don't know what the people want or what the people do not want. I, I, I know, know what, what the, the people, people need. <laughs> I know what the people need. Precisely. The people need a government. The people need stability. What will happen tomorrow when Begin orders them to rise up and take over the Knesset and then bring down the government? 
These people have lost all that mattered in their lives. They are not prepared to forgive Germany for that in return. For money? You yourself said that we can never forgive Germany. So what if I did? Sprinzak, it's not a mere matter of forgiving the Germans. You are the speaker of the Knesset, for heaven's sake. You know the economic situation we're in. We've absorbed hundreds of thousands of immigrants while still fighting a war while still under siege. Took in all the refugees from Europe. Rehabilitated them. No country in the world has ever had to face such challenges. How do we build them houses? How do we build factories? How do we build an army that can protect the little we have? We need to take this money. But you've already told them all this, and you still haven't convinced them. Whether they are convinced or not is no concern of mine. I am not a prime minister who panders to newspaper headlines. I am not a prime minister who incites the masses in town squares. I am the prime minister of the state of Israel, and my sole intention is to do only what is good for the state of Israel. But what about yourself, Ben-Gurion? This agreement will forever be a stain upon your legacy. Only what is good for the state of Israel. That's all that's important. I will see you shortly in the session hall. In the end, leadership is the personal example you lead by. I know many people who talk about the Negev and the provincial areas, and then they go back home and live in the center. Ben-Gurion said we should settle the Negev, and he went to live in the Negev. And with us, at Steboker, a young community with poor conditions, we barely had a road back then. That's a leader. Our security cannot exist without incorporation of the diaspora without the elevation of humankind throughout Israel, and without the settlement of the desert. The settlement of the desert. Good. Now please get me some draft paper and a pencil. <clears throat> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. One, two, three, Four, and that's five. One, two, that's ten meters long and five meters wide. Excuse me, sir, but what are you doing? These are the measurements. Tell them to build the hut according what to this. What hut, sir? At Stable Care. We were there together. Don't you remember? That young communal settlement in the middle of the desert. I truly envy them. He who believes in it must go and settle the land. I've done nothing but talk about it for too many years. But how will you run the government from the Negev? I won't run it. Eshkol will lead it. Until then, we'll need lots of shelves for all the books. Eshkol won't lead it. He doesn't want to. They'll hand the government over to Charette. You know what? Let them. The youth. The youth will follow an example. They won't follow speeches in the Knesset. But, but you're not resigning. You can't possibly resign. And why not? Because you're David Ben-Gurion, the founder of the state of Israel. We all founded the state. And what do you know about farming? Huh? What's that supposed to mean? I was a worker and I shall remain a worker. <laughs> do you remember? I was a shepherd in Sejera. Yes, but then you were 20 years old. But I myself must do that which I demand of others to do. But what will happen to us? Who else can lead like you? Yitzchak. Yitzchak, a real leader, believes in the people. Sometimes even more than they believe in themselves. You will succeed. But aren't you afraid? Afraid? Of what? that you'll be forgotten, that new people will come and forget everything you ever did for us. Those who want to will remember. Those who don't will forget.
I have done everything that I could do. We now invite you to continue your visit and enter the original hut, the home of Paula and David Ben-Gurion, at Stéboker. Thank you.